Well, as we take our Bibles and return to Luke chapter 16 this morning, we're reminded that there has been a certain group of people who have been listening to Jesus teach about wealth. So I'll give you a moment to turn there, so that way you have the answer in front of you. Luke chapter 16. Look with me as we start off in verse 14, and you'll see the answer right away. But what group of people has been listening to Jesus? The Pharisees. And you look back all the way to the beginning of chapter 15, and you see something very similar. What group of people has Jesus begun speaking in parables to? There in verse 2 of chapter 15. The Pharisees, they have, you like the easy answers, right? And so you have to see that all the way from chapter 15, verse 4, to our text here today in chapter 16, the Pharisees have been hearing all that Jesus has been saying, including the parable and the teaching that Jesus has been sharing with his disciples here in Luke 16. Because right, we did make note of that uh, last week, back at the beginning of chapter 16, that Jesus turns his focus to his disciples here in chapter 16, verse 1. But the Pharisees haven't gone away. They're still here. They're listening in the background. And now they come to the foreground. And so this means that the Pharisees have been hearing Jesus tell his disciples how they are to use their wealth that they possess in this life, and that how they use that wealth will determine whether or not they will be received into the eternal kingdom of God. They've been hearing that. The Pharisees have heard Jesus teach his disciples how necessary it is to be faithful with the wealth they possess, because the wealth they possess is not their own. It's God's wealth. And the disciple of Jesus is a steward over that wealth. So if a so-called disciple of Jesus proves himself to be unfaithful, and we looked at this last Sunday, if he proves himself to be unfaithful with what God has entrusted to him, if a professing Christian does not manage the temporary riches of this life in the way that his Lord and Master desires of him, he will not receive the true eternal riches of the life to come. So the Pharisees have been hearing all this. And they've also heard, most recently, Jesus teach his disciples about the impossibility of serving God and wealth. The disciple of Jesus literally is not able to have both as his master. It's impossible. He cannot love God and wealth. He cannot be devoted to God and to wealth. Now, why would the topic of wealth be of particular interest to the Pharisees? Why would Jesus' words that he's been sharing with his own disciples why would they affect the Pharisees in any way? Again, if you're cheating and you're looking at verse 14, you'll find the answer. Because in verse 14, we see that the Pharisees had their own views about wealth, don't they? We're given a window into the hearts of the Pharisees that tells us their view of wealth. What does verse 14 tell us about the Pharisees' view of wealth? It says, now the Pharisees, who were what? They were lovers of money. Now, these are the same people who viewed themselves as the stewards, the keepers of God's law. And these are people who, who viewed themselves as the example for the people to follow. They loved money. So what do you think is going through the minds of the Pharisees when Jesus says, you can't serve God and money? What's the reaction of the Pharisees when Jesus says, it has to be either or? Verse 14. 
How do they respond? Verse 14 continues, They heard all these things, and they derided him. The Greek word here literally means they turned up their noses at him. They don't say anything that would help us get a better understanding of their heart, but they don't need to say anything, do they? Because sometimes actions speak louder than words. And we know all that we need to know about how they react to Jesus. They absolutely disagree with him. The way they see it, they can love wealth and love God too. They both fit into their paradigm and so it's a significant problem. And we probably know this, maybe some of us don't, but many people today have the same problem. Even religious people. And it really doesn't matter what flavor of religion a person identifies with. It could be a, a person who is religiously Muslim, or a person who is religiously Hindu, or religiously Catholic or religiously Baptist. It doesn't matter. The big problem that many religious people have is that they lift up their own life as the standard of righteousness. Do you see that? Does that make sense? When push comes to shove, people look at themselves and they say, I'm doing okay. I'm good. I don't need any conformity to any other standard. My standard works. And that's what the Pharisees are guilty of here. So when Jesus condemns their love of wealth plus their love of God way of thinking, they don't even consider for a second that they might be wrong and that something has to change. And so they turned up their noses to what Jesus is saying. There's nothing wrong with the way that we're living here. What's Jesus' response? <laughs> oh, yes, there is. There's something hugely wrong with the way that you're living. So you see in verse 15, Jesus says to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men. To everyone you see, to everyone you know, you declare yourselves to be right in the sight of God. That, that's what it means to justify yourself, to declare yourself to be right. You say, my life is the kind of life that God is pleased with. My life is blameless in my conduct. But what's the reality? They can hold themselves up before men and say, I'm right, I'm blameless. But what about in the sight of God? What does God see? What does God know? What does Jesus say? God knows your heart. Now, you, you put on a good facade, you put on a good external, you might fool people. But you can't fool God. For what is highly esteemed among men, Jesus says, is an abomination in the sight of God. It's detestable in his sight. So what man holds in high regard, what man cherishes most, what man exalts, what man lifts up, as ultimately desirable, if it is not God, it's an abomination. If it is not God, it is a vile filth in the sight of God. God will not have second place in our lives because God alone is worthy of our love and devotion. So this is the root of the Pharisees' problem. They had taken money, which used rightly is just a simple tool 
that we use to carry out God's purposes. That's what it is. It's a resource to accomplish God's will in this world. But the Pharisees had taken money and they had made it more than that. Right? That's what happens when you exalt something. You make it more than what it's supposed to be. The Pharisees had taken money from its rightful, lowly place as a resource for doing God's will, and they had increased its importance in their affections. They had come to love and to serve the idol of money. I think you recognize that the Pharisees had done a very serious thing. I want to take a moment here to ask the question, are there any of us here today who are guilty of the same thing? If you were to look back over the last six months and you were to examine your actions and your pursuits and your choices, would you find something in your life that you have been prioritizing or prizing or passionate about more than God. Because what Jesus is saying here today, that can't be the case for a disciple of Jesus. There can be nothing in the life of a genuine Christian that takes priority over God. And it doesn't have to be money, you understand. There are other things that can be idols in a person's life. What about a certain possession? What about a, a hobby? What about family? What about a job? Can these things too join money as a potential idol in our lives? Can we not elevate them in some form or fashion so that they take priority over God? And here's the, the difficult part of it all, is that it may not even be intentional. I mean, some of you work in jobs where you feel like you're forced into making certain decisions that you otherwise wouldn't make. I mean, how many of you feel like out of necessity you have to keep this job at all costs? I have to do what my boss tells me to do, even though I know it would be disobeying God's word to do so. Some of you are, you have family members who do not love God who are not following Jesus, in fact, are, are completely opposed to Jesus Christ. How easy is it for us to yield to the pressures of family, to do what family's pressuring you to do, so that you have peace with your spouse? But I have to give in here, or else I'll never hear the end of it. I have to give in to this pressure. I'll have to walk on eggshells around them for the rest of my life. I have to give in to the pressures of my family because I won't be welcomed at family events otherwise. So I need to give in to my family, even though I know by doing so, I would be rejecting what I know God's word says. Doesn't that make family more important than God? And some of you know this very intimately because you, you struggle on a daily basis with spouses who are not saved. And there's a clash of loves there because you love Jesus Christ and your spouse loves himself or herself. That's going to create tension. It's going to create pressure. There's going to be constantly that, that, that weight on your shoulders to yield to the pressure of your spouse or your family members and give way before what you know to be right. However, that something comes to take first place, whether it's intentional or seemingly unintentional, 
if it comes to place God as a center of your life, Jesus says it's an abomination in the sight of God. It's an idol that has been set up one way or another in the place of God. And there's repentance that must take place. Because only God is worthy of being the center of our lives. Only God is deserving of first place in your heart. For the Pharisees, that was money. Right? And, and some of you probably have heard this. I think it comes from Blaise Pascal. He says that in every person's soul, there's a God-shaped hole. But for the Pharisees, money had filled that God-shaped hole. And what made matters worse was they thought that God and money could share that same hole in their hearts. And Jesus has begun pointing out that the very big problem with that view of God, anything that fills even a fraction of the space that belongs to God alone is detestable in God's sight. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to idols. God doesn't share his glory with anything. Not false gods, not family, not wealth, not anything. As we come to verse 16, Jesus actually steps back and approaches the Pharisees from another angle. Right? So you see kind of a, a change in the momentum here. He back, steps back and says in verse 16, The law and the prophets were until John. Until that time... Or since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying that with the coming of John onto the scene, a significant next step of God's sovereign plan has gone into effect. Before John came with his baptizing ministry, the law, the prophets, what we would call the Old Testament... That was the revelation for the people of God. That was what his people were accountable for. And that was the entirety of what his people were accounted, accountable for. The law and the prophets was what Israel was responsible for obeying and for practicing in their daily lives. But with the coming of John, a new word from God had also come. Keep your fingers here in Luke 16 and turn back to Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3. Because you see the message that John comes bringing. I'll start reading in verse 1, but we see the message in verse 2. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what did he come preaching? He says, Repent! Why? Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does that mean it's, it's, it's out there somewhere? It's a couple of centuries down the road or it's far away? What does that hand mean? It's right here! <laughs> I mean, it's presence, it's coming, it is just around the corner. It is just a matter of very short time before it's here. Before it's arrived, it's nearly upon you, so repent. And that's what his ministry was focused on, right? His baptism was not like Catholicism, where you're baptizing to wash away original sin, which doesn't actually happen. But his baptism was one that was an expression of repentance to God. You come, you repent, and that baptism signifies the washing away and the forgiving of that sin. So we come back to Luke 16, and we see that's what Jesus is telling the Pharisees. Since the coming of John, that same message, the message of the kingdom of heaven, or as Jesus says here, the kingdom of God, is the next chapter of revelation from God. It's here. 
Right? No longer is it something afar off. It's now. This message has begun to go out. The good news of the kingdom of God is right now being proclaimed. And look at how people are responding to it. Right? How does Jesus say people are responding to it? They're making a beeline for it, aren't they? Right? They're pressing into it. And some translations say, and the word literally means, they are forcing their way into it. It's like Black Friday at the mall. Right? Some of you have been there, you know what I'm talking about. I, I hopped on, on YouTube the other day, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty crazy. People are just pushed up against the doors, ready for them to open. And as soon as they open, they're pushing and running people over to get inside and get the deals. It's like the grand opening at a theme park, right? Just pushing their way in. And that's how people are responding to the gospel. But not the Pharisees. goes on to say, by the way, you Pharisees, you'll agree with, I, with what I have to say next. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. All right, the law and the prophets were until John, but with the coming of the, the gospel of the kingdom, that doesn't mean that the law and the prophets are kaput. Let's try to piece together what Jesus is saying here. Maybe you feel kind of scattered. Let's see if we can bring it together. So the law and the prophets, they were in full force until the coming of John. What happens at the coming of John? It's the proclamation of this message, right? In the Old Testament, in the law and the prophets, God had been promising an eternal kingdom. This kingdom would come. It would last forever. We see details like the throne of David would be established, right? So we have a descendant of David sitting on the throne, ruling this kingdom that is to come, knowing that this kingdom would endure forever. That's the promise that the people of God have been waiting for. That's the promise they've been looking for. That's the promise that right now with the coming of John and now the coming of Jesus, they've been expecting very very emphatically. <laughs> like, is it here? Is it here? And with the coming of John, a new word from God has been given. The kingdom of God has come. The door of that kingdom has been opened. And people are eagerly forcing their way into it. But that does not mean that the law and the prophets have become obsolete. Right, I'm using, trying to use words carefully here. Because something has happened with the law and the prophets. But they've not become obsolete. Right? The word we see at the end of verse 17, it's translated fail here in our Bibles. It literally means to fall or to be destroyed. Is that what has happened to, you could say, the Old Testament? When I hold up my Bible here, do I only have the New Testament? I don't. I have the law and the prophets, as well as the gospel of the kingdom right here in this book. So that's clear evidence of the fact that the law has not failed. It has not passed away. It has not been destroyed. And so with the gospel of the kingdom of God coming, it does not mean that the law has been somehow conquered or teared down by the gospel. There's no clash or contradiction between the Old Testament and the gospel that has resulted in the demise of the law. And let me just share with you a few verses that clarifies and confirms the fact that God's word, any part of it, will never pass away. Psalm 119, 151 says, You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. Here's another one. Psalm 119, 160 says, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures, how long? Forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands, what's the word? Forever. Is that talking about the New Testament yet? That's all Old Testament. 
which means that the coming of the gospel of the kingdom of God does not undermine the law and the prophets. It does not cause the law and the prophets to fail. Heaven and earth would have to cease to exist before even a piece of a Hebrew letter from God's law could fail, right? You have that word tittle there. It's literally, it literally means a hook or a, or, a, or a horn, just a little protrusion of a Hebrew letter. Not one of those can fail. Heaven and earth would have to pass away before one of those failed or was destroyed, was brought to nothing. So if that's not the case, what impact does the gospel of the kingdom have on the Old Testament law and the prophets? What does it do with the law and the prophets? The gospel of the kingdom actually completes the law and the prophets, doesn't it? The gospel of the kingdom fulfills the promises of the Old Testament. And the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God is this, right? And we can, we can summarize this. What is that good news? But if it's good news, I want to hear it. What is the good news of the kingdom of God? And essentially it's this. If you will repent of living life your way, and you submit to Jesus as Lord of your life by living his way, God will give you a place in his kingdom. Isn't that what Jesus has been saying all through Luke's gospel? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Let him lose his life for my sake and he will find it. Blessed are you if you are, if, if you are hated by men, if you are excluded by men, if your name is cast out of evil by men, for my name's sake, rejoice and leap for joy in that day because your reward is great in heaven. That's what Jesus has been saying all along. He's saying, you deny you, you submit to me, and I will bring you to the kingdom. The first problem that the Pharisees have is that they are blind to this fact. The law and the prophets are being fulfilled right before their very eyes. They are being fulfilled in the person of Jesus, and the Pharisees don't see it. And in reality, they don't want to see it, do they? Right? God doesn't work contrary to our natural inclinations. All right, you think of Moses and Pharaoh. God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And many of us would recoil and say, how, God, can you do that? Well, it wasn't against Pharaoh's will. It wasn't like Pharaoh was saying, God, teach me about yourself through Moses. No, God just went right with Pharaoh's own will and did exactly what Pharaoh wanted to do. Same thing with the Pharisees here. They were blind and they wanted to remain blind. They didn't want to see that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. But the second problem that the Pharisees have is that not only are they blind to the fulfillment of the law and the prophets that's taking place through Jesus, they are in fact breaking the very law that they profess to keep so faithfully. Right? And that's what they pride themselves in, right? I keep the law. I keep every little detail. I even go beyond that and I keep laws that protect the laws. In verse 18, notice which law Jesus implies that they are breaking. It says in verse 18, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read verse 18, I said, what does that verse have to do with anything that Jesus has been saying? Does that kind of cross your mind? Like if you're trying to fit these verses together in context, right? Not just taking verses isolated from verses, but you're trying to fit them together. It's like, whoa, where did this come from? Because at first glance, it doesn't seem to fit the passage. Now, we do understand, I mean, and why don't you turn back to, um, to Matthew 19 with me. Matthew 19, we do see that divorce was a significant issue with the Pharisees. 
Right? That's not something that is, is new here in Luke's gospel. We can read exactly how the Pharisees viewed uh, divorce here in Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus addresses it here. Look with me in verse 3. It says, The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Right? And, and some of you know this. There are two different schools of thought. Uh, one school of thought said that you can divorce your wife if she burns your supper. Or does any little thing to make you frustrated or, or to give you a bad day. It's like, all right, you're done, wife. There's another school of thought in the Pharisees' world that said only for reasons of sexual immorality. Right, and that's what we see in Scripture. So you have these Pharisees coming to test them with these potentially two different views, saying, what do you think, Jesus? Can we divorce our wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Of course, they come back and say, then why did Moses say we could? Right? Why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? And Jesus said to them in verse 8, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. It is never God's intention that a man divorce from his wife. That is a sacred bond. Now we understand that there are sometimes circumstances in life that for perhaps the safety of a spouse require some kind of intervention, whether it's separation, whatever. But when God, and this is what Jesus says, God joins a couple together. It's God who has put them together. Unsaved, saved, doesn't matter. That is a union that God has sanctified. And it's never God's intent that it should be separated. And he goes on to say here in verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now let's look back at Luke 16, 18. Because we want to, again, we're trying to figure out why, why is this passage here in our context? Why does the gospel writer have this right here? We know that the Pharisees did have a wrong view of divorce. They were wrong in their flippant and careless view of marriage. But I don't believe that is the reason why this topic of divorce is included in this passage. What's the issue that Jesus has been addressing up to this point in Luke 16? All right, look back, verses 1 through verse 13. What is the primary issue that Jesus has been dealing with? Right, and you see the word show up three times in those 13 verses. Depending on your translation, it, it, it might read mammon. Or another way to translate that is what? Money or wealth. That has been the topic of discussion that Jesus has been teaching to his disciples. And then you come to verse 14, and that discussion leads over to affect the Pharisees, doesn't it? Because what does verse 14 say about the Pharisees? They what? They were lovers of money. That's the context that Jesus is dealing with here. So what does this conversation, this very brief insertion of this teaching on divorce have to do with a love of money. When we come to verse 18, I believe that Jesus is doing something much more than a random teaching. I believe that Jesus is using this teaching on divorce as a sobering picture of what the Pharisees have done with God. 
The Pharisees, they've left God. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, have walked out on God. They had abandoned God and they had committed adultery with money. I want you to turn back with me to the book of Jeremiah. Because this kind of charge that Jesus is making about the Pharisees is not a new one with the people of God. Jeremiah chapter 3. We see some significant parallels between the way Israel and Judah treated God then in the Old Testament and the way the Pharisees were treating God now here in the New Testament. But Jeremiah chapter 3, now, now when you go home this afternoon, I know our brother, brother Dave likes to give homework after Sunday, so I'm going to give you homework for when you go home today. I would encourage you to read actually chapters 1 through 4 of Jeremiah. Or at some point this week, and you'll see, you'll feel the weight of what God's people had done. But for the now, this morning, I'd just like to read for you verses 6 through 14 of chapter 3. All right, so Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 14. Listen very carefully with, with what God's people had done with God back then. And notice the parallels between what God's people did then and what the Pharisees are doing now. Verse 6 begins, The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Right? She was adulterous. She was immoral. Yet her sister, her treacherous sister Judah, did not fear, but also went and played the harlot. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Right? Talking about what? With idols. With false gods. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense. That sound kind of similar here to the Pharisees? Verse 11, Then the Lord said to me, said to Jeremiah, Backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, toward Israel, and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and have scattered your charms to alien, to foreign deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. You see the similarities? You see the comparisons there between Old Testament Israel and Judah and New Testament Pharisees? What had they both done with God? They had left him. They had sinned against him. They had been unfaithful to him. And they had committed adultery with an idol. Friends, the Pharisees had all the revelation they needed to be faithful to God. Did you know that? They were lacking in nothing. They had the law. They had the prophets. And they had God's own Son proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. They had everything. But the Pharisees, they weren't forcing their way into the kingdom of God like other people were doing. The religious leaders, they weren't eagerly pressing into it. 
because the way that Jesus says they had to enter into the kingdom of God is not a way that they found acceptable. Jesus was saying that the way into God's kingdom required them to abandon their love of money. And that didn't match up with their way. Their way made allowances for their love of money. Their way allowed them to maintain their love of money. But their way was a way that made an idol out of money. Their way was a way that attempted to divide the heart between God and money. But as Jesus said just back in verses 12 and 13, no man is able to do that. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot love two lords. You can only love one. You can only exalt one. You can only highly regard one. And if that one is not God, then your master is an idol. And God will not take second place to any idol we might raise up. So what is wealth to us today? What is it to you? Is money something that you love to use for God's purposes? Or is money a lover that you have left God to go after? The Pharisees are a case in point. You can be religious in appearance, but an idolater in your heart. You can look the look, you can talk the talk, but God knows your heart. And God will judge us by the thoughts and the intents of our heart just as righteously as he will judge us by our works. But God will not bless those who have committed adultery with money in their hearts. So as we conclude our time today, we just need to step back and see what Jesus is saying. Only those who have renounced their love of money only those who have renounced their love of wealth, only those who have renounced the love of anything this world has to offer, of anything that might take place above God, they must renounce it and give their love to God alone through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. They alone will enjoy the riches of the kingdom of the one that they have loved. That's the truth of God for us today. So I pray that God will help us to search our hearts and make sure that no idol has begun taking up residence. And if it has, that we would tear it down and return to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we ask you today that you would help us. Help us in our pursuit of you. We know that without Christ, it is impossible. Without faith in Jesus, we cannot please you. Only the righteousness of Jesus can make us acceptable in your sight. And Father, I know that those who are here today who are followers of Jesus Christ, we desire to please you. We desire to live loving you alone not letting anything else take priority in our lives. Father, that is our desire. That is what we want. And so I pray, Father, that there will not be any idol that seeks to creep its way into our affections, not intentionally, not unintentionally, not in any way. But let us daily seek you in your word. Let us daily seek to rest and the peace and the satisfaction that you are our God and your approval is all that we need in this life and help us to love you more than anything else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.